Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you to the organising committee for allowing me to come and talk to you about uh, some of the work we've been doing in Newcastle. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, two projects uh, that I've been involved with. Uh, the first one is the building, uh, parameterising, validating and testing of an integrated model of IGF and ROS signaling that's shown some very interesting uh, results and novel dynamics. And the second is actually something that's been set up by uh, Kieran Walsh, who's sat at the back there. Welsh, sorry, not Walsh, sorry. That's very bad of me. Um, looking at uh, a workflow uh, and Python scripts to uh, look at the optimization problem um, in, in, in a model to uh, be able to get them all ready for an identifiability identifiability analysis and particularly using the model from the first section in the second section as a sort of beta test for the for the uh, for the workflow. Um, so it's well known in aging that the connections between nutrient signaling, damage response, stress response are all uh, one interconnected and all really important for uh, aging pathologies, aging conditions. Um, so, but the overall dynamics of the system are still relatively uh, up for debate, should we say. In particular, the reaction of this system to ROS There's sort of two conflicting schools of thought, or at least two uh, conflicting schools of thought, um, in terms of the reaction of uh, effectively downstream to, let me get the right button, uh, mTOR1 and cell growth and division and all this sort of thing, where one, one, uh, one school says that uh, you apply ROS to the system and mTOR1 levels drop so that you get a conservation of energy that can be used for somatic maintenance. Whereas the opposite, which is uh, again from, from experimental observations, is that mTOR1 levels go up so that the proteins are still being generated so the protein turnover can still occur to remove damaged proteins that are being affected by the ROS. So, we aim with our model to hopefully try and shed a bit more light on where exactly we sit. So taking a systems biology approach, in, in fact this is the core element of my PhD, um, was doing this whole systems biology approach. Um, so integrated model and data generation, we constructed a kinetic ODE model, uh, collected an initial data set, well actually two data sets, to parameterize the model, and then we collect a hypothesis data set, so a, ro a data set with ROS involved, uh, with which to test the model to see if the model structure, based on one of the hypotheses of how everything should work, actually fits and works. And then match conditions to the hypothesis and test, but we'll see where we are at, at that point. So this is the this is the model that we uh, that I constructed, which looks at. Um, a, very, a very small subset of those proteins that I showed before uh, in the IGF and ROS stress and sensing signaling. So we have uh, AKT up here, or its associated environment, FOXO, uh, FOXO3A in this case, uh, mTOR1, mTOR2, TSCs, and the, all the interconnections between them um, with nutrients feeding in as, as shown. Once we constructed the model, we needed to get a parameterization data set. So we collected two data sets of time course Western blocks. One being for a starved state, and the other being for a uh, fully fed state. Now I did this because the one of the hypothesis, the three state hypothesis, uh, is heavily linked with the starvation data set, where the application of ROS effectively locks in a starved state in the cell. So this is why, why we started with with a starvation data set and the fully fed data set. So we fed these into the model, parameterized it, and it fit pretty well, actually. Um, it was uh, all, all the chi-squares were within uh, good bounds for, for the number of parameters within the model. And the profiles look quite nice, as you can see here. We've got the uh, full nutrients data set and the starvation, and these were parameterized together in, in, the, in the same procedure. So after we've done this calibration, we then generated another time course Western blot, but this time with a uh, steady state 0.5 micromolar uh, 
ROS generated in the media using the Roxcat system, which uh, Alvaro alluded to earlier. So as to generate some, a chronic stressing ROS system to see how this would affect the cells and then to compare it to the uh, prediction from our parameterized model. Now that didn't fit quite so well. Um, as you can see, there's humongous gulfs between the, the data and the uh, model predictions. But in particular, it's worth noting, I'll zoom in on a couple of them. So here we have the uh, what the model uh, simulates for ROS and for full nutrients. You can see that the activation of mTOR1 is, is much higher in the experimental data compared with what the model would predict and also compared with the previous data set. And the corresponding the level of AKT308, which is uh, repressed by a negative feedback loop from mTOR1 and F6 kinase, is also experimentally a lot lower than the model predicts. So this was, if we go back to the two hypotheses I mentioned, this would lend us to think that well, maybe the activation of mTOR1 is the more important story, at least in terms of what we are looking at. But in the model, there's no method for ROS to activate mTOR1. Uh, oh, sorry, yes. Uh, so we confirmed the observation of the uh, mTOR1 activation using a 4 ebp phosphorylation uh, tag as well. Uh, as you can see, you've got the control data set, which is the fully fed data set, and the uh, 0.5 micromolar state state ROS. So we needed to figure out how ROS was feeding into the system and how it would uh, affect downstream. And so we built three different models for possible feed-ins from ROS to various, uh, to various elements within the model. Now, I know there's four red lines, but that is a deliberate mistake, um, as it were. So the three models is ROS feeding into AKT, which is obviously the top two lines, uh, to, uh, by increasing AKT308 activation, uh, repressing TSC complex, uh, and by repressing AMPK complex. So we built models with each of these connections in separately and refitted the parameters using the ROS data set and the fully fed data set. Uh, and then we used the AIC score to compare them. So compared with just re-estimating the model as it was, uh, both the 308 model and the TSC model had significant improvement of fit by a comparison of control. Uh, AMPK didn't really improve it, uh, and, uh, so we've discarded the AMPK. So we then proceeded with the principle of, well, it's either AKT or TSC. We looked at the uh, literature, and there was already some studies that had sort of observed something occurring with TSCs um, that had blocked the, uh, the activity of AKT and still seen this uh, activation. And so we proceeded with the principle that probably TSC, so we'll look at that first, and then if it, AKT needs to be looked at, we'll look at that as well. Um, and so then we uh, switched to uh, mouse uh, knockouts, uh, mouse TSC knockout cells. Sorry, yes, the data originally was generated in uh, MRC5 cells for humans. Um, and as you can see, with the control cells, um, which are these two, the uh, dark and the slightly less dark, um, you get the same activation as we saw in the human cells. But when we knock out TSC, the activation doesn't occur. So this leads us to a final, taking the final model structure out, not useful. Um, this leads us to a final model structure where ROS activates TSC uh, in the conditions that we're looking at. So that's sort of the first half of the story. The second half of the story is looking at this uh, optimization problem workflow. Now, identifiability, I'm sure everybody is aware of identifiability, etc. And again, I'm, I'm sort of back to two, two, not schools of thought this time, but there's sort of two extremes as to how people view identifiability, I think. There's some people who think that identifiability definitely needs to occur on every single model, and every single parameter needs to be identifiable for the predictions to be valid. I'm not going to offer an opinion one way or the other, I'm just going to put that out here. <laughs> <laughs> And there's the other extreme where a validated model, irrespective of identifiability, that is able to do, produce repeatable predictions is fine as well. Like I said, I'm not for an opinion. <laughs> um, however, 
as it's a thing that needs to uh, is becoming more and more common, uh, Kieran is, is going to explain tomorrow. He's created a uh, toolbox for identifiability in Capazi, and I'm presenting the workflow that helps to limit the optimization problem to the point at which you get the uh, identifiable parameter set that can then be tested using here in software. Um, so this is, this is effective workflow. It's, it's fairly, fairly intuitive workflow. For many parameter estimations, visualize the uh, it's RSS, isn't it? Yeah, I forgot to change that, sorry. Um, this one. Uh, visualize the RSS using the histogram. Uh, and locate an appropriate location to uh, truncate the data or truncate the visualization of the data. Visualize that truncated data. Uh, Calculating the profile likelihoods for the identifiability is sort of a much later step once you've actually gone through a few rounds of this. Um, and then use the information to constrain the optimization problem, iterate, and hopefully you'll get to an identifiable set of parameters. So I'll just quickly run through this. Uh, Many parameter estimations, usually about 1,200 parameter estimations using a cluster, genetic algorithm, these settings, and fairly wide boundaries. I still SSR, obviously, yeah. um, except on the, on the actual thing. Um, and then this is, this is an example of the, the, the model I just showed running, running through, uh, through this workflow. So here you can see that there's a, a very large local minima it's about 2.8, and the actual sort of best value parameter set is somewhere down here. So we can effectively disregard uh, these, and that reduces. I mean, here, here is an example of 700. We've got rid of over 650 of, of the parameter sets by just truncating off that off that to uh, everything above 2.6 for parameter sets that aren't producing a good fit. Um, so now we've got this, we look at the, each individual parameter values for these different, uh, for these different uh, parameter sets. Uh, so for example here we've got uh, FOXO uh, moving out of the nucleus back into the cytosol, uh, MPK initial concentration and MPK uh, phosphorylation initial concentration. And again we can see here that there are definite areas where <coughs> there is a, where the, the uh, parameter value is likely to be because of because of the frequency of, of the occurrence within these low uh, low RSS data sets. So we can then constrain the optimization problem by constraining the parameter boundaries, for example, where the arrows are, and then we do the whole thing again and again and again and again, and then feed it into. Uh, the identifiability software, which Kira's going to talk about at length tomorrow, to hopefully get an identifiable uh, model. So, quick quick run through two projects. <coughs> Demonstrated the three-stage hypothesis, which I mentioned, unable to match that data from the first section. Um, mtor one activation, as predicted by the protein turnover hypothesis, so this idea that protein turnover is much more important than uh, maintaining the uh, energy available for uh, energy for somatic maintenance, although it, obviously to turn over the protein is part of somatic maintenance. Um, the mechanism for this induction is TSC repression, and then we've used the model to test and compare, well, we are using the models to test and compare optimization workflow for this identifiability, and hopefully see what the identifiable model compares to uh, to the one using just the validation method. And then you, in the future we use uh, PyIdentify, which is the software Kieran has developed, um, or the toolbox rather, to perform a profile likelihood analysis. Thank you very much, and these are the people I've worked with on these two projects. I knew some. I knew somebody had asked. Um, <laughs> my, my current thinking at the moment is that it's it's horses for courses, as it were. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do. I think a lot of things you can 
if the if the uh, predictions are able to produce a, a repeatable, yeah, the model's able to produce repeatable predictions from being simply validated, then that seems to be enough, certainly for something like the, the first uh, part of the presentation I showed. However, when you start delving down into things like sensitivity analyses and, and things that require much more uh, sort of uh, constrained parameter sets and much more well-defined parameter sets, then maybe there is a case there for pushing towards the identifiability. However, overall, this is for people well beyond my ken to decide, really. That's just where I'm, I think about it at the moment, personally. So I think that's probably the most diplomatic answer I could give, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you... Oh, sorry, I was just to find out, this uh, um, identifying um, mm. toolbox, is it freely available? Can we access it? Because uh, I'm sort of cheating at the moment. I've been telling my colleagues, you know, we are sort of working on this at the moment, um, using... Uh, Sounds like a question for Kieran tomorrow. <laughs> Basically, yeah, Kieran, Kieran's going to run through it all tomorrow. I'm, I'm throwing him under the bus a little bit here, but yeah, he's used to it, it's fine. Um, yes. So you seem to equate Ross's with H202. <laughs> yeah. um, we applied H202 to the system, and we accept that when the H202 actually goes into the cells, it will be processed by the cells in whatever way the cell will process, the, uh, process it and thus produce whatever uh, reactive oxygen species would normally be produced by the cells from these lo longer lived reactive oxygen species, the, the peroxide, as it were. Problems with the shorter lived ones, which is the hydroxyl radical. True, but the, the fact that they're shorter lived means that it's only the ones that are produced by the cells that really need to be of concern, as, as far as I, I think about it. if they killed all the proteins on the way. Well, this is true. This is true. I... I, I, yeah, I, I should yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I, I had a similar question earlier than you, Douglas, but no, I want to come back to the uh, uh, identifiability. Yes. Which is very important uh, problem, and I'm, I'm glad you're doing something with it. But you, you, you put it in a way that it sounded like you're only looking at practical identifiability. Because you said, Models are, we, we, we iterate this until it's identifiable. So, yes. There are models that are not identifiable, no matter how many times we iterate. Yes, um, I, I should have made that a bit clearer, yes. We're, this is for a, a practical identifiability for the program I like to But there is, um, there is some elements that Kieran's working on that uh, are for structural identifiability. Well, that's practical and Yes, that, that's, that's, that's what um, the group that proposed it said, but I would, if I were you, I would look a bit more widely. There yeah. are also toolboxes for structural identifiability analysis. Unfortunately, they don't use compatible, but they're asking about compatible. The, the, other, the other thing is the advantage with the workflow is that you're taking some of the element of structural whilst you're doing the workflow before you even do yeah. the PLN analysis because you're pushing it all the way to the bottom of the parameter, the bottom of the RSS range anyway. Yeah. So you are you are pushing the structural a little bit. You, you can't push the structural. Well. The structural you will need to change the equations. There well, is no. no way around it. And that's the thing. If you have it, you will continue having it no matter what. Sorry, I'm, uh, that, was, that was me uh, saying that wrong. I meant um, not, uh, we're not, uh, you, uh, the other advantage of the structure is you look at the, the global uh, uh, global area where the uh, profile likelihood only does the local. So if you've got a, a local fit, then that's that's fine. But there could be another one and another one and another one. Whereas with this, we are pushing it all the way to the end. So we deal with a lot of the global at the same time. I got to global yeah. and structural. So, I mean, I'm not confused. Really it's actually quite nice, but uh, I'm just saying, if you have structural identifiability, it's something you want to know at the beginning. Cause yeah. Um, and if, if you have it, it doesn't matter what you do, you will always continue to do it. Oh, no, and you, you need to address that at the, at, the model, at the structure of the model rather than on the, on the brand addressing. Yeah. I mean, this, is, this is true, and the advantage with, again, the, the, the workflow that Kieran put together for this is that there's very few steps that are, need to be done manually. The, the truncation of the data needs to be done manually, but the rest of it's all Python scripted and everything, so you, you can relatively rapidly get once you've got the setup right get from get from a model to a to a, a identifiable premises set hopefully um, 
practically identifiable parameter set. Or we'll, I'll phrase it like that before <laughs> we get any <laughs> more trouble. That's good. Okay, any more things more for Philip?